So, David, uh, this uh, piece in The Nation magazine is the culmination of several months of investigative work and also came from uh, a, a man who uh, dealt with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and uncovered uh, basically through his own great misfortune in dealing with J.P. Morgan Chase um, a, a rather important story about Chase's, uh, I guess, essentially paying of a fine. So why, let's start it at, at, at the beginning. Why don't you tell us what that fine, I think people remember, but what that fine was about. Right. So J.P. Morgan Chase, like all banks, uh, committed some uh, illicit, uh, uh, some would say, uh, fraudulent practices during the rise of the housing bubble and, and its aftermath. It's uh, the financial collapse. And there was uh, there were a number of uh, settlements, civil settlements that the government entered into for this misconduct. And it's a variety of misconduct, lying to investors, ripping off homeowners, uh, using false evidence in court. And uh, most of this misconduct was was wrapped up in these settlements. And the the unifying feature of all of these settlements was that most of the penalty, the cash penalty that was announced, wasn't in hard dollars. It went, uh, it, it was this thing called consumer relief. And consumer relief meant that J.P. Morgan Chase would cut the balances of mortgage loans that troubled homeowners who were struggling to keep up with their payments had, and uh, they would use that, that, that relief to satisfy their obligation uh, under the settlement. So the, the idea was supposed to be, yes, J.P. Morgan pays this price, and some people get to stay in their homes. And, and this, is, um, this is like the equivalent of, of some form of, of plea deal, I guess, but in, but in, civil, in yeah. civil terms, and some notion of like, okay, here's the plea deal, and um, maybe you're going to get uh, community service so that it benefits the community, or maybe you have to pay back. Maybe you have to work a certain number of hours as restitution. Right. It's it, that's the dynamic here, right? Prosecutors. Yeah, the idea is the idea is that uh, you know, in addition to paying a, a punishment, we're going to uh, try to get something done that works in the public interest. People were losing homes at record numbers. And if we can get some money toward them to, to relieve their burden, then maybe they can stay in their homes. So, so the idea was, was kind of a, a, a two birds with one stone thing. All right. Well, that sounds uh, good. And, and maybe we can talk a little bit later in this, uh, uh, this talk about how actually that would have been a great model for the U.S. government uh, to have engaged in, frankly, um, around that time. OK, so that sounds all well and good. You're going to give uh, homeowner relief to uh, what is it like uh, tens of thousands of people and. Um, uh, uh, it was it was a million that was uh, that that was the promise uh, at the beginning of the biggest of these settlements, the national mortgage settlement of 2012, with five banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase. However, when this this whole settlement was written, it was written with the input of mortgage bankers that knew uh, ways that they could gain this settlement, so that they would uh, quote unquote pay a price. But it wouldn't affect them really uh, directly. They, they could pay with other people's money. And, and this story that we found is the most extreme example of that. All right. So um, how is it that um, the J.P. Morgan Chase managed to pay off this fine, essentially get credit for giving right. breaks to um, – to homeowners uh, to basically pay down this fine. How, how did they go about doing it? Right. So here's what they did. They uh, they had this storehouse of loans that were really, you know, uh, over 180 days overdue. They, they had these terrible toxic qualities. These were loans they wanted off their books anyway. And in 2009 or thereabouts, they sold a big package of these loans to this guy, Larry Schneider. 
uh, and uh, they, they, they sold them with the idea that they had no more interest in these, in these loans whatsoever. They sold them off. Three years later, many of Larry Schneider's borrowers start getting letters in the mail from J.P. Morgan Chase saying, because of a settlement with the federal government, we are canceling your loan. You don't have to pay anymore on this loan. They didn't own these properties anymore. They had no interest in these properties anymore. Yet they decided to go ahead and cancel uh, the mortgages on them, or at least uh, appear to. And uh, this had, uh, you know, multiple different benefits for J.P. Morgan Chase. Number one, well, wait, wait a second. Uh, let's stop. Their loan. Let's stop. Let's stop yeah. here for a moment, and let's just go go backward here. So I want people to really uh, understand. In two thousand nine. Right. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase has this uh, group of loans, this tranche of loans yes. um, worth how many uh, millions of dollars? It was about one hundred and fifty six million dollars, all told, uh, of in, in raw value. Like if, if every dime was paid on these loans. That's OK, how much it would be. so they have these loans. They know these are very bad loans. They it, yes. it could range from uh, they're delinquent, but also the origination of these loans was probably also problematic. Maybe they don't have That's documentation correct. to support it. Maybe it was like the, the the ninja loans or the liar loans or whatever it was. Right. And. They don't want it on their books. Why? Why do they want to sell it For so desperately? For several desperate? reasons. For several reasons. Number one, they uh, don't think that these are going to be collectible loans at all. So they're going to be liabilities, right? So any money they can get for them in the public market is a plus. Number two, uh, because they had these defects in them that you just referred to, they didn't want federal regulators to see them because they know – that they were uh, fraudulent in some way or another. And if regulators got a hold of them, they would know that there was legal exposure on the part of J.P. Morgan Chase for uh, originating or, or perpetuating these loans. So uh, they just wanted them out. They wanted to walk away from these loans. Now, when the settlement comes up, they realize that they have to uh, take credit uh, for releasing a bunch of loans. They have to you know, be able to find uh, uh, loans that they're able to cut the balance on. So what better way to do that than to find loans that they don't own anymore, cut the balance, which costs them nothing, and take credit under the settlement for those those properties. So in their thinking, too, they sell off. Now, if it's $156 million worth of loans, if they had been paid off, I don't know, it's sort of hard to sort of figure out exactly how much money – um, that involved actual money that they paid out in those loans uh, to people because that $156 million reflects probably many instances either a, a, a 10 year or 15 year or 30 year uh, interest payments or yeah, something like it's that. A, it's, it's, a, it's a best case scenario number in certain cases of these loans, it's, it's nothing close to what they would actually reap from them. However, if they cancel the balances, they get to take a substantial portion of that balance as settlement credit. So these are really good loans for them because it costs them nothing to release them. And uh, they get to take a large amount of credit under the National Mortgage Settlement, another settlement that they did, uh, to, to get rid of the loan. And effectively the speaking... Penalty. They could have found, I mean, this is be like the equivalent of them finding a list of people who had loans with other banks and just right. writing them and saying, guess what? We have right. now said you are released from your obligations with your loan and uh, right. we're going to take full credit for releasing your obligation and pay off our fine with that. God, you know, uh, peace be with and you. And, and the reason they thought they could get away with that is because they never transferred the actual ownership documents to Larry Schneider. He had been trying for three years to get the promissory note and the mortgage and all of this information. They never delivered it to them. So Chase was able to sort of jump in and out of ownership whenever it suited them if they wanted to, you know, take credit. They could say, oh, we own the loans. If they were getting heat from law enforcement, they could say, oh, we sold those loans to Larry Schneider. Don't worry about them. 
So this was the shell game that they were playing. All right, I want to take a quick break. And when we come back, David, I want to start with how do we know they were actually playing the shell game and it wasn't just incompetence? And what is the biggest piece of evidence that you found that implicates Jamie Dimon in uh, in terms of his knowledge that this was going on, because we're we're going to hear if 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 they have to account to this, and maybe they won't. Um, oh, I had no idea this was going on. We got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with David Dan on this blockbuster story: how America's biggest bank paid its fine for the 2008 mortgage crisis with phony mortgages. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. <laughs> 